Great, thanks for everybody for being here. This is probably one of the most important sessions of the week or the three days, which feel like a week. So how many people here like water, drink water, right? Food, energy, okay. It's all about the nexus, right? So let's ask a couple quick questions and then I'll tell you what we're doing here. How about that? Um, so who's an entrepreneur here? Great, I would say probably everybody is since we're all here. Um, who's a corporate? A corporate, if that's actually a noun. Um, and then who's an investor? Raise your hands really high. Awesome, so great. Mark your spots. Awesome, great. Um, well, the water food energy nexus is probably one of our most profound challenges on the planet. It's this interplay and add in climate, the intersection of climate and water, food, and energy. Um, and so it is a powerful, powerful value chain. So that's what we're going to explore today in this really dynamic, very, very cool setting. And I'm your guide, or at least one of your guides. I'm J. Carl Ganter, and I'm managing director of Circle of Blue. And we're journalists and scientists. We're reporting on what we feel is this most important story on the planet. Uh, also run a company called Vector Center, where we're using perception and reality to provide real-time data tracking on these global risks. So I mentioned a value chain, but we have an extra perspective here called the value track. So let's introduce it now. Thank you. You could say, as a value track, I'm a marketplace for business development by connecting people and resources. The aim of the value track is to speed up go-to-market for purpose and profit-driven solutions and skill innovative, innovative development. We do this by zooming in where the heat and the need is, and then we connect people and resources. Not just here today in this room, but it is an ongoing value track. Plugging into other events and build a common thread to leverage what we do here, today, and connect you to next events as well. Welcome entrepreneurs and all relevant stakeholders. Terrific, well thank you. This is our value track, which will keep us on track and also add perspective and context. Um, so we're going to invite our first our entrepreneurs up um, to the stage and give us some quick pitches and backgrounds. Uh, let me ask uh, Gunnar Larson and Reinhold Feenstra and Joshua Foss and uh, Jan David, please, up to the stage. <laughs> Great, and Gunnar, we're gonna start with you. So you are gonna, we're gonna start with you. <coughs> Terrific. Okay. Thank you uh, for having, uh, having us here. Uh, my name is Gunnar Larsen and I'm, I am the CEO of uh, Saline Farming. Saline Farming is a company uh, based in the Netherlands on an island. Uh, I will get back to that if everybody can see the slide. We, uh, our principle is based upon three, uh, three majors. The first one is uh, Saline Farming uh, Agriculture. The second one is uh, Saline Farming Aquaculture. And the third one is uh, Tessel Tasties. Tessel Tasties is a company that, uh, that uh, directly uh, sells the output of all, 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 all our uh, entrepreneurial, agricultural and ag aquaculture uh, products uh, direct to market. Um, I have a quick picture on where Texel is in, uh, in, uh, in reference to, uh, let's say, London and Brussels. Uh, it's in the north of the Netherlands, uh, so you have an idea. Um, why agriculture? Why saline, uh, saline agriculture? 97% uh, of the world water is uh, salt water, it's seawater. 1% uh, is uh, fresh water. Uh, that leaves 1% uh, for uh, brackish water. And the rest is uh, locked into icebergs. These are uh, uh, staggering numbers if you, if you think of it. Um, we already have a shortage of water and 70% of the fresh water is already being used by agriculture. So that leaves 30% for, uh, for consumption, which isn't much. And uh, things are about to get worse with uh, climate change. Um, and we have to start producing more food with less water available. So uh, our company is specialized in uh, using brackish water as a valuable resource. Um, uh, we, ha we have so much uh, salt water and brackish water that if we make the right mix between, uh, between those two, 
is uh, we can grow crop. Uh, for instance, uh, seawater has an uh, electricity conductivity EC of 50, uh, and the water coming from the tap right here in the, in the men's or in the ladies' room has a 0.03 EC, almost no, virtually nothing in the Netherlands. Um, one billion hectares is salt affected. Uh, it is uh, approximately three hectares per minute, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, added. Uh, we are trying to fight this uh, with, uh, with, uh, in, in many ways already, but uh, we try to, uh, to use the brackish water as a valuable resource. What do we do at Texel? We have uh, the only uh, functional uh, reference benchmark in the world uh, actively, which we have uh, divided in many squares. And we can, uh, we can create a mix of seven salt con concentrations, four, eight, 12, 16, et cetera, et cetera, to, uh, to make sure that, uh, that, that, that we can test what crop grows with what kind of brackish water. Uh, we have uh, an example here uh, in uh, Bangladesh. We believe in uh, to see is to believe. So we had a, we had a, we had a test field where uh, the local methods in the front, uh, you can see nothing grows there. Saline farming methods in the back, everybody was really happy uh, feeding their families and bringing food to market and uh, big carrots coming out of it. Main focus of saline farming is the aqua, the agri and the tessel tasties. Thank you for having us here. Great, thank you, nice job, nice job. So, one of the cool things about this space is not only the speed we have to move at, but also, so everybody's time on time, but we also have an incredible urgency here. I mean, just globally. So I wanna keep that in mind, that's why we're scooting along so quickly here as well. So, right out, take the stage, please. Thanks. So, fresh water scarcity is rapidly increasing. Over four billion people are already affected by this and its number keeps growing. Growing population growth and climate change will only make this matter more urgent. And at the same time, water is not only the water we drink, water is part of everything we do. But then when we look at the earth, which was just mentioned, 70% of the earth is covered by water. Of this, only 3% is actually fresh water. The remainder is salty seawater. But even less water, less than 1%, is actually the accessible fresh water we have available. So when I look at this as a water engineer, I can only conclude that the key to more fresh water lies in the seas. So that brings us to desalination. But desalination has been out there for many decades. It's been used in the Middle East, in Australia, and even the US. But this is considered expensive because it uses a lot of energy. And this energy is being generated using fossil fuels. And fossil fuels, again, contribute to climate change, which again results in more freshwater scarcity. As you can see, there's a vicious circle here. Also, desalination is considered complex, uh, not easy to maintain and only for large scales. But this is all about to change. My name is Reinhard Veenstra. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Elemental Watermakers. We provide fresh water from seawater using only renewable energy sources, such as the sun. And we've been doing this since 2012. We provide water up to 70% cheaper in the areas where we are focusing and without using fossil fuels, but instead using the widely available sustainable sources from the sun, wind, and even wave energy. We provide reliable systems that can produce fresh water easily uh, using remote monitoring, automation, and the use of durable components. We are active in over seven countries uh, with more than 10 systems operational, and we expect to add another 10 projects to this map this year. We provide turnkey solutions to resorts, industries, municipalities, communities, and private properties. And this hasn't gone unnoticed. We've been awarded with the Global Water Award from the Shaikh in Dubai for our technology. So, if you are working on improving the water access in coastal regions and you want to do this in a sustainable and cost-effective way, then please join us in solving freshwater scarcity using only the sea, sun, earth, and wind. Awesome, nice job. Great, great. Okay, great, so now we have Joshua Foss and Jan David. Tell us about what you're up to. Wonderful, thank you. You bet. Good afternoon. 
I'm Jan David from Environet, and I've been unlocking sustainable investment opportunities globally for over 20 years. And I am Joshua Foss with Regencia, and I have been really working at the front end of shifting the urban design paradigm for the past 12 years. So we are here to speak to you about a regenerative utility model, which we acknowledge is really well positioned to address the complex challenges of the 21st century. So this is a typical city of one million people in the year 2019. It relies upon a centralized wastewater treatment plant or two uh, and systems, uh, systems and sends solid waste to unmanaged landfills. Uh, current global averages show that 20% of the wastewater uh, is treated and 14% of the solid waste is usefully recovered, the rest going untreated or unrecovered. So now we flash forward to the same city in the year 2050 and we see that the population has doubled and yet we require 20 times the current capacity of wastewater treatment and 30 times the current capacity of solid waste management. Uh, just uh, to, sorry, to reach 100% coverage. Well, this poses an overwhelming and unrealistic uh, public investment burden. So our solution essentially is providing an alternative. So uh, building off of trends in integration, in uh, distribution and circularity, the Regenerative Utility Center provides a groundbreaking alternative to the conventional utility model. Basically, it co-locates multiple functions and enterprise uh, functions within a single location and utilizes closed-loop circular processes. It transforms conventional costs and liabilities into valuable resources for local use, and it's locally attuned and adaptable so it can support a lot of community interests that are highly attracted to that community itself. Doing a quick fly through of the particular process and function, we can see here how the wastewater and solid waste is brought to the site and managed. And nutrients from the waste is then brought forward into biogas, into energy and heat, and also uh, fed into an on site aquap aquaponic food production and algae production system. And another uh, unique value of this is really its community benefit uh, infrastructure an enterprise center that supports business development solutions for the community itself. It becomes really transformative, however, when integrated within an, a regenerative utility network that supports a coordinated uh, distribution of these facilities and interfaces it with local enterprises and other systems such as regenerative agriculture, renewable energy, uh, and uh, additional water treatment. So this definitely presents a grand vision, so question I'm going to pass back to Jan, is how do we identify and then capture the value within this approach? Well, Josh, we need to run to capture value. <laughs> the regenerative utility network gains, uh, brings gains that can take both financial and economic forms and are realized through new revenues, new markets, and systems-wide savings. Uh, in summary, there is growing recognition globally that the siloed nature of the conventional model of utility development cannot meet accelerating urban development needs. We're excited to offer a viable alternative. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, appreciate it. Great. So back to the whole theme of we have to run. Um, and our, no, I mean our urban systems. Um, so thanks guys, really appreciate it. Thanks for coming up. Um, and now we're uh, Evo uh, Demers. Um, Evo, you're gonna give us a quick tour of the Nexus and add uh, a bit more uh, clarity and context to this incredibly complicated issue, right? Yes, I'll try to do that. Thank you, Carl. Um, my name is Ivo Demers. I work at Wageningen University in research, and together with 6,000 of my colleagues, we work on a daily basis on researching our living environment and educating the people who can solve the problems of tomorrow. Um, but today I'm here to talk about uh, water, food and energy. We, I'm happy to see all of you talking about a lot about water and, and also taking action. Uh, but there's more to the nexus. Nexus for me is about seeing the interlinkages between water, food and energy. 
Uh, what does that entail? Um, we need to increase our food production by 70% before 2050 uh, to keep up with um, population growth and keep up with our living standard as we do now. Uh, first speak, speaker already said 70% of the fresh water is used for agriculture. So where does the water come from? Um, climate change will decrease our water availability also for agriculture, but also for energy. My colleagues, they calculated that 16% or even 19% in Europe, um, energy production loss uh, can be a result from climate change. And that it's not only about water availability in quantity, but also in the quality. If the water is too much, has too much high temperatures, uh, it's not fit for cooling, for cooling water, for instance. So that is what the Nexus is about. Let me take you to, um, to the Himalaya, where we looked at melting uh, processes of glaciers. 60% of the Indus is melting water. So if snow doesn't come out of the sky, but rain falls out of the sky, what happens in Himalaya often, also in Chile and the Andes? It means the water is down in the river immediately. Uh, and if the crops are not growing at that moment, the water is lost. The water is also not available for drinking water later in the season, where normally melting water would be available. So that is why we need to understand the complex system of the water, food and energy, all seeing in a holistic approach. Um, in the Himalaya, we are now bringing that to the farmers. Uh, we translated all the information and data and modeling up to a level of 5 by 5 kilometer grid. So that means that farmers with local administrations can change their cropping patterns, can change their drinking water pr production methods. Uh, and then I'm happy to, uh, to use all of your equipment and knowledge to actually do that. Um, but we can also do with the larger companies. And then I bring you back to the Netherlands, the southwest of the Netherlands, a big delta in Europe, uh, where we have industry, uh, large cities like Rotterdam, but also Tannuise uh, and Bruges on the Belgian side of the border, all need to have their uh, sustainable water security. Industries, agriculture, drinking water, and ecosystems. Um, we put people on the table there to find the integrated approach there. Um, because drinking water will always prevail. So where does that leave our industrial water? Where does that leave our ecosystems? Well, there we found out using technologies, but also using our knowledge of the entire system, we found out that we better can make use of fresh water where needed and make better use of salt water where possible. And what we are doing right now, we're putting technology into practice, actually building pilot plants, but also talking to governments, because we also need to change policies, making it uh, available, uh, making water available for different uses as it is now. So we need local water boards and even um, national government in the Netherlands to change uh, their water policies. So join us on that table, join us to understand the water food nexus, and then we can solve a bit of the puzzle, Carl. Awesome, great, thank you, thanks so much. So really two words, two words, integrated innovation. I mean, what's, what's more interesting than that? We had the water session earlier today at 11, and we started talking about this whole idea of integrating innovation and how do we get out of our silos or our little glass jars, in a sense, little guppies, little fish licking each other. In our, in our water silos. But to talk more about the perspective of the global challenge, we have Kuhn McMahon of USAID, um, who's going to give us a quick, really awesome perspective. And thanks, you've heard a lot about the challenge that we have uh, around this water food energy nexus, and governments can see that challenge and the growing need in the next 20 to 30 years. And so we started to support this nexus, both in food energy and water food over the last five years. Uh, we've had some success with innovations that are at the nexus and they've actually helped over six and a half million farmers produce more food with less water and make more water available, save 17 billion liters of water, reduce carbon dioxide emissions by more than 10,000. Uh, and so, but we need to do more. 
we have a really big challenge. And so in the coming few months, we're actually going to launch a new initiative around the nexus of water, food, and energy. How do you support all three areas of the nexus at the same time and then grow and scale to reach millions of people uh, to address the challenge? Terrific. Nicely done. And, and how we've, in a sense, <laughs> How we've, in a sense, branded the Nexus. I mean, literally, this has been a 10-year process really accelerated by USAID and some of the other organizations. So we're going to check in with the value track, and we have a citizen input. Thank you very much. The most important step in the value track is to understand whether there's a shared purpose. This is the, the perspective of citizens that are also represented, represented in this validation. Salon farming is increasingly becoming a priority to make agriculture product productive in the coastal ecosystems of Bangladesh. As of the Delta Plan, an estimated 5.2 million people will be affected due to increased salinity and temperature, and the majority of them will be poor. 30,000 square meters of land will be rendered saline and unproductive, which will result in an increase in migration. Let's check on the next perspective to make sure we have a 360 view on the shared purpose. Corporate. Great. Um, OK, so we're going to ask uh, Jan Willem uh, Vosmeer. Um, and then also uh, Arthur de Krupp, um to add some more perspective to this um, around shared resource and, uh, and the corporate perspective. I just want to add that you know Bangladesh, uh, another one of these high countries of high risk. So salinification, sea level rise. Uh, we heard about river flows and how river flows are changing, um, how that can affect uh, arable land. So um, Jan Willem, you're up first. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to this specific uh, example, but we'll tell you a little bit about what we do on water. Perfect. Uh, but it's very recognizable because we also have a brewery in, uh, in uh, Jakarta, and we see the same we see the same kind of problems. So my name is Jan-Willem Vosmeer. I'm part of the Global Sustainable Development Team, uh, working amongst other subjects on, uh, on water. Uh, water is very near to our heart. We are a Dutch company originally, but now in more than 70 countries with 170 breweries, uh, water is 95%, 95% <laughs> uh, of beer is water. Uh, so it's really a part of our product. And we also need water for growing the crops, mainly barley. Uh, so that's why we always work on water. And uh, what we see is that more and more breweries are in water-stressed areas, already 26 out of the 170, and that will grow in the coming 10 years. Uh, so that's why we are scaling up uh, our ambitions for water. We just launched our 2030 water strategy, which means that we will continue to increase our efficiency in breweries, but that is not enough. We need to take a look beyond the fence of the breweries because that's where it all will happen. Uh, so we are trying to maximize circularity in those breweries. It is uh, uncharted territory because we need to find other users in the, in the vicinity to reuse our uh, treated wastewater. And that we're, we're, that's where we need innovation. Um, but also, uh, where can we uh, get resource recovery? We already use uh, wastewater sludge to bring to uh, 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 farmers uh, to use as an organic fertilizer. We use it for, uh, for biogas, so uh, a way to go there. And then uh, we want to balance all the water we put into our products. We want to get that water back into the local watershed by uh, supporting reforestation, very important, but also by restoring ecosystems and wetlands, like we already do in Spain, where we saved uh, more than 1 billion liters in the Donania area. And then the most important is collective action, and probably it's also the hardest part. So working together with NGOs, with governments, with farmers to address this shared and very, very precious resource. Thank you. Great. Nicely done. Thank you. Uh, quick, quick, quick trivia question. Um, which SDG goal is collective action and collaboration? Yeah. Anyone? 17. 17. Well done. OK. Terrific. Uh, Arthur, you're up. All right, thank you. So uh, first of all, I'm curious, um, who in the room is leading Avenger or is part of Avenger team working on water? 
So please raise your hands. All right, all right. Because we're looking for ventures related to water. We are looking for ventures related to food and ag tech. And why? Because yesterday evening, we launched DNA Lab, the data and analytics lab, powered by SaaS. Until yesterday, we were serving 90% of the Fortune 100 top leading corporates in the world who are in need of a robust, scalable data and analytics platform to perform in their business. But we are opening up. We're opening up for corporate ventures and for ventures who are really scaling up their business, helping this world be a better place. So if your venture is looking for scalable fitness for the next coming years, we invite you to come over to the Netherlands, to our premise here in Huizen, nearby, and to locate yourself and your team for three months, just gratuit, just for free, for three months, and we will help you create your data and analytics platform in such a way that you are scalable fit. What we see is that there is a lot of startups and scale-ups who are really ambitious, have a great team, have a great product, have a great business proposition, are really anger, of a, uh, angry to perform and to make a severe contribution to the global challenges. But most of the time they lack the way they perform in their data model and their, pre, um, 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 their, their insightful information for other partners in the in the ecosystem to uh, to be a um, um, co-partner in this ambition they are thriving for, and that's exactly why we're opening up from the SaaS data and analytics company now open for you to help you out. There's room for four ventures this year, so please, if you're if you're anxious to to be part of this new DNA lab come to us, Edwin Peters is over here, I'm here, we're here for you. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you both. So, so now we have three words. We have now incubation added to our, um, added to our innovation and integration. Um, so we're going to go back to the value track because I think we made a pretty good case. We have a challenge here and we have some solutions here. How are we doing? Let me check. Economic growth, societal improvement, proven solutions, scalable. We definitely got a shared purpose. Let's look for some impact. Okay, great. So, confirm from the egg back here. Um, <laughs> Had to say that. Can I just add that this has also been done, this research with many stakeholders. So what we see here on stage is a represent, are representatives of bunches of stakeholders all ready to collaborate. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So we're, we're just in the shallow end of the pool um, to try to work in some water puns here. Um, so let's move to some investors. Let's get some investor perspective because I think that's really, really critical um, to give us that perspective. Uh, Preeta, Ariam, uh, if you could step up and add. Um, the nexus is important, right? And we're seeing lots of links and lots of opportunities. What's that look like from the investment perspective? Well, thank you, Carl. Before I answer that question, yeah. can you please spare me 20 seconds to really thank the three innovators that were up here earlier. Some brilliant pitches and um, some real hard work that's gone in there as well. So uh, something that uh, we do embrace. So thank you. But to answer your question, uh, as Evo had pointed out, I mean, I'm not going to preach to the people in here who know all about water and Nexus and the importance around it, but Nexus is incredibly important for us to not only just embrace these really um, energetic, uh, integrated approaches, but it's more around uh, how do we live for today and tomorrow. Um, so the nexus is uh, super important in for us to, uh, as, 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 a, as a human race that continues to live on this planet Earth, to go forward in um, embracing the challenges of climate change. I think that's, that's, I think that's something that I do need to put out there, um, because as a development financial institution, climate action for FMO is our priority as well. So that's, uh, that's a really, really important 
and innovation is something that we do embrace around that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how do we move investment forward quickly when we have this big risk environment? Um, what do you invest in? How, how in the world do you avoid these, these big speed bumps or or even holes in the road. Yeah, absolutely. Um, risk, we, we love that word at banks. I think any investor around the crowd here know what that is all about. Uh, we had a colleague from USAID who said they've taken 10 years to get to where they are. It's not because uh, they've been sleeping on the wheel. It's just they've been working towards those risks and abating them and trying to see how they, they can get closer. So on that, on that note, um, FMO, we are the Dutch Entrepreneurial Development Bank. Key words here for today in terms of, 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 of many things. Um, we do embrace these risks, but what we do is, and what we don't see, and why people are turned around is, um, an idea is always great people, but an idea doesn't get us anywhere. We need a business case, yeah? Uh, return on investment, you made that point. Whatever we put in, we do want to see our money back. At some point, we're not saying today, tomorrow. There are different banks, there are different institutions that want different returns at different times. So that's what a DFI does. Now, FMO has taken one further step as a development financial institution around this. We have just been awarded the Dutch Climate Fund in development, where it's, uh, it's, it's completely different, where a DFI has now collaborated and partnered with two strong NGOs, SNV Netherlands and the World Wildlife Fund for Nature to help us originate these bankable projects. So what we see coming through the door are lovely projects, but they're never bankable. So what can we do? So we are having some funds available to actually originate these projects to bring it down to the finance funnel as well. Um, so we are embracing this. We are taking a step forward um, as a financial institution, and we're not the only ones. Um, but one of the key uh, risks are around the policy. So some of your innovations and ideas are brilliant, but depends where you want to apply it. So if you're going to a country where the policy does not fit or what we call a conducive environment is not fitted, it's just not going to work. So how do you navigate through that? And these are uh, the, the core thing here is partnerships. So your SDG 17 is where we, we call upon. So we're not doing this as on our own as a financial institution. We're doing it with yourselves, the innovators, but plus other partners who know how to navigate through this. So. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you. Nice job. Yeah. There'll be an opportunity, of course, afterwards to go deeper into asking some of these some of these questions, like ESG and some of the other pressing challenges. Because we we have this: how do we actually calculate investment and how do we calculate return today? Um, so back to our value track briefly. Um, so we're focusing on constraints. What are some of these constraints? What are some of these risks? Exactly. When I mentioned that we're looking for where the heat and the need is, we must understand whether these risks are real for the people that experience these as business development hurdles, corporates, innovators, and other parties. So we checked with our value, with our value track network, and we got indeed back that constraints are looking for new strategic partnerships, being able to support their business cases in order to go to market. Thank you. Great, great. And I think, again, back to framing that whole business case in this scenario of accelerating challenges. Um, but we're going to check in with our innovators in the room. Um, and uh, we're going to talk to, I think we have um, Bianca is... Can I Actually, you think first it would be good to hear the perspective of our innovators. So I would like to see some hands of oh. innovators that have a constraint. All right, I see many, uh, well, yeah, you go. Okay, uh, I got a good case study on, uh, on water purification technology. My name is Gary Katz, uh, Katz Water Technology. We invented a new thermal distillation system, and we do the entire thermal distillation process inside the heat exchanger to drastically cut the cost, uh, the equipment cost, the energy cost, and we can run it on waste energy. So we deployed this technology in the oil and gas fields in Texas, and we're doing it at small well sites where they're producing quite a bit of uh, produced water, which is some of the heaviest contaminated water. And we're running it on the waste gas, which is the flare gas, so there's no energy costs, and getting pure water. And we can recycle the discharge brine as a drilling fluid to create a new circular economy with something that was previously two waste products. I had a meeting with one of the largest oil companies in America, and they love the fact that we can cut their disposal costs. One of the issues is, even though they can reuse some of the fresh, pure water, 
they cannot reuse all of it. And when they said, what are we going to do with the water? I said, we could sell it to farmers and ranchers who can't farm and ranch anymore. They said, we're not set up to it. I said, fine, I'll take the water and sell it and make the money. They said, well, uh, what about the liability of that? And that's only going to uh, provide some of the water. We're producing so much water. I said, use it for beneficial discharge. Replenish the waters and streams. They said, we're worried about the legal liability of uh, even though this is fresh water, if we discharge in a waterway there's gonna, and there's any contamination, they're going to look for the deep pocket. Everyone hates oil companies. They're going to blame us and sue us. So these are the constraints when you come up with ideas that should uh, that are improving the system is that these big companies don't always see the uh, nexus and how do we change that perspective so they can look at the big picture, not just the risks involved. All right, so I hear now a constraint, which is more like policy related. So is there another kind of constraint that we have here? All right. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Oliver, Oliver Uja, and I work for Skyfox Limited, Ghana. I'm Nigerian, but I live in, and work in Ghana. And Skyfox has uh, offices in uh, four, uh, three other countries, uh, Burkina Faso, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Uh, we innovated um, a biofiltration process that enables us to uh, purify water and use it for uh, food production. So we're able to uh, uh, use water multiple times to produce uh, fish and also uh, uh, biofilter that uh, for more production of fish before we turn it to crop irrigation. So, but uh, one of the main problems that we face is capital. And it's not just capital, but impatient capital. Because uh, the way we operate, we work with communities to empower them. So we provide infrastructure for them to be able to produce. And the demand for this is increasing every day. But we also expect uh, these uh, beneficiaries to pay for the inputs, for instance, uh, the fingerlings and the feed. And so, um, and given the, our um, um, environment, we are, uh, you know, you can get as much as 30% uh, interest uh, if you're looking for capital. It is difficult to be able to go to such sources and get this to expand and get more people on board. So this is our major problem. And it seems that uh, finance uh, you know, should not be uh, looking at uh, what is bankable, so to say, but looking at innovations. It shouldn't exclude good ideas or innovations that can you know, uh, uh, scale up and can impact more people. So if there's a way we can uh, you know, uh, find, I mean, get investors or uh, uh, other financial institutions to work with ideas, probably uh, uh, you know, uh, at small scale and graduate over time, I think that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you. So I hear so. now policy, I heard investment, or mm -hmm. actually patience capital is what I heard. Um, any other constraints? Any organizations maybe what I'd like to see? Wonderful. I see you're very enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do one and then we'll go there. <laughs> and make it a short one then. It'll really be a short, short one. Yes, thank you. My name's Marilyn Bruno. We discovered novel chemicals in the ocean. These are green chemicals and nature's natural mechanism to inhibit the ability of bacteria and fungi to attach to surfaces. They are natural anti-fowlers. So when you're doing aquaculture and other uh, filter filtration, uh, do remember this. We're, we're here because NASA recommended us. We are the only chemicals that have worked to remove contamination from the water reuse recycling system on board the ISS. We've done a three-year project with NASA. Our big problem is scaling up the chemicals. They're found in nature, very difficult. So we've synthesized 25 of them and got regulatory approval. But chemicals is an area that most investors are not familiar with. We need patient capital to get our chemicals into the marketplace, and that requires scale-up, first-time synthesis, mm -hmm. and, of course, the regulatory. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So again, I hear some, yeah. Give her the floor. Uh, some patient capital here as well. Um, then I saw you were just here, or because this I think is the last one. Because I think we're running out of time, yep. right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm Bianca Nijhoff from the Netherlands Water Partnership. And if I think about constraints, and I heard a lot of people talking about it, it's indeed about different organizations trying to work together. Because there's marvelous solutions, which I've heard this morning on water. And now again, again, hooray to all the entrepreneurs and the ideas, they, the developments you have gone through. But the collaboration, and I heard Jan Willem from Heineken stress it, uh, the collaboration between maybe governments on the one side, businesses, the NGOs, the different, the different um, values they have and how we have to learn about one another's values. Something in my organization is the Netherlands Water Partnership where we also have NGOs, knowledge institutes, businesses and government collaborating. You notice that there's very much different languages which they speak. So when we learn to appreciate one another's values, we're already coming closer to talking, to starting to talk and to understand and to speak one another's language. So I would, I would really stress, uh, and I see that we do that in our work, where we work with, with the Dutch companies, but also in different places in the world, by addressing the, the values we have, and specifically the value to water, which um, we ourselves are about 60% water, so there's a huge value to it. By addressing that joint value, we are really, it's possible to make a step forward. So um, again, the technology is impressed with what I've saw, but let's now also try and, and, and share the values we see as the different, with all the different minds we have. So um, that's just one of the solutions towards uh, solving this issue maybe. Yeah, that's a terrific point, too, because when water doesn't have a value, as we've talked about many times, and as the Netherlands and a, and a range of others were involved through the World Economic Forum and other organizations, the high level panel on water, talking about values and value for water. So speaking about value, back to our value track. Thank you very much. As Minister Kaag said this morning, it's all about collective brain power and it's all about collective execution power. This is exactly what we want to achieve in the value track. If I know what your constraint is, I can connect you to these people I see here, but also who I have seen and met in the road to GES. And we're not going to have another event not leveraging what we're doing here today. So exactly this, announce what resources you are looking for, what solutions you are looking for, and we make sure that all stakeholders can announce the resources they have to offer. So let's not see these as constraints or as risks, but let's turn it around. Let's start execution on where the executing on where the opportunities are. If I only see what we've heard today, can you see how many people and resources we can connect? Absolutely. Um, thanks for including Circle of Blue there. I um, appreciate <laughs> that. So we're going to hear more about how we can connect um, from Kieran. Where's Kieran sitting? There he is. Okay. Um, Kieran, grab a microphone here. Well, good afternoon. My name is uh, Kieran O'Quinn. I'm the Center Director of the Middle East Desalination Research Center, or MEDREC. We have a very simple mandate. It's to find solutions to freshwater scarcity. And nowhere is that mandate more urgent today than in the first 24 to 48 hours after a humanitarian crisis. If you take two examples, after a tsunami or a hurricane when salt water covers the land, or after an act of war, a water infrastructure has been destroyed and there is no access to clean, fresh water. If we can get to those people who are affected by these crises within the first 24 to 48 hours with fresh, clean water, that is a humanitarian game changer. We can't really do that today. And to do that, we have partnered with the, to address that challenge, this humanitarian um, uh, challenge, we've partnered with the, with the Research Council of Oman to provide $700,000 to the first team who can provide a handheld, low-cost desalination device, device for rapid deployment in a humanitarian crisis. So what are we looking for? Well, we need a handheld device. It has to be small, held in one hand, very, very light. It has to be able to desalinate seawater. There's plenty of devices there today who can, which can take some uh, dirt out of the water, but none that can actually desalinate. It has to be off-grid, completely unconnected to any external power source. The power has to be within the, within the unit or from the sun. Um, it has to be easy to use, simple pictorial images to um, instruct anybody how to use it. It has to work for a minimum of 30 days. It has to be able to produce at least three litres of water a day. It has to be light, resilient, and crucially, be available for $20 per unit. Now, the technology to do this is there today. It's a bit too big. It's a bit too expensive. 
And what we're doing is putting $700,000 there to get people who haven't really thought about this yet to work with the people who are thinking about it and hopefully produce this. And once we have this in place, that is a complete humanitarian and game changer for humanity. There's the website. Anybody who wants to get involved can just contact us there and hopefully we can give you $700,000. Thank you very much. All right, great. And Peter from our Marine uh, Energy Alliance. Where's Peter located? There he is. Get your microphone here. Thank you. My name is Peter Schijgrond. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, from the Dutch Marine Energy Center. And uh, we are a social enterprise uh, accelerating uh, marine renewable energy solutions towards commercialization. And marine renewables, we're talking about tidal energy, wave energy, ocean thermal energy, and salinity gradient. And if we would be able to effectively harness this resource worldwide, we would not have an energy problem. At the moment, it's a fully uh, abundant resource. It is highly predictable and reliable, but not yet used, because the technology is still in emerging stage. So as DMEC, we are helping organizations uh, to advance along the TRL skills, technology readiness levels, with technical and commercial services. We're building international collaborations um, within the marine energy sector, for example, with Deltares, who is here, with the uh, National Water Partnership, who promote us abroad, uh, technology developers like uh, Redstack, who is there, Salinity Gradient Power with a pilot scale on the offslide dike, Pretty amazing, generating electricity from just sweet or fresh water and salt water. That's very interesting for the future. So um, this huge potential, uh, how do we put it into practice? We have a number of projects. We're running actually over 60 million euros in projects. And one of them is a marine energy accelerator. And there's an opportunity also for technology developers, for investors and governments to engage with us. And that's my call of action to you. If you are uh, an investor, we're calling on you because we'd like to partner you with the number of technology developers that are in that project. And you can join a long-term platform whereby the risks are low to spread over a number of demonstration projects because we're trying to reduce risks in order to make it more bankable and more interesting for you as a financier. If you're a government, my call to action for you is look at marine energy as a significant part of the renewable energy mix in the future, in the next 10 to 20 years, and put it in your policies and your strategies and make sure in terms of regulation we get access to demonstration zones, which is very important. And then finally, for the entrepreneurs and the technology developers, I also have money to give out. We have vouchers worth around 100,000 euros each, and the call is open from the 1st of November, and we're inviting uh, around 40 technology developers to enter a proposal, and the winners uh, can get either techno technological uh, or commercial services. And finally, we are hosting a large event uh, in October in Amsterdam, the Marine Energy Pavilion in the Rai, a huge event with uh, about 10,000 people coming there. So we'd like you to join there if you're interested in this sector. Thank you for your attention. Awesome. Great, thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, Wood, where are you? Where, Woodhoff from Groasis. Right behind me. Oh, here we go. Okay, great. And just a reminder too, we, heard, we have money on the table, but also time is money. We're running a couple minutes over, and I think we'll all be probably good with that. This is really, really interesting and valuable. Okay. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wout Hoff. I'm the CEO of Groasis. We operate in a nexus of food, water, land degradation, and climate change. And our technology addresses seven of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We've heard earlier today how food production needs to increase, how agriculture already consumes 70% of global fresh water, and how dozens of countries are already facing water stress. While in response to these challenges, Croasis has developed the ultimate technology for agroforestry and for ecosystem restoration. This slide shows two of our core products. On the left-hand side, you see the reusable water box, and on the 
uh, right hand side you see the grow box which you see here the grow box is a revolutionary product that allows the planting of one tree in combination with four vegetables and the beauty is that the users of the Groasis ecological water saving technology have a triple 90 benefit our technology is 90 percent cheaper it saves 90 percent water and it still results in a 90 percent survival rate our IP is patented in more than 100 countries, and we have 49 scientific reports available. Now, over the last 15 years, we have planted more than 300,000 trees in 43 countries. We are active worldwide through a local distributor network, and we are in dialogue with a number of governments to help address their food and water issues. All these activities have led to letters of intent signed by governments and corporates for Groasis to plant more than 100 million trees over the next eight years. So our challenge, so to say, is that we need to scale up our organization and we need to create a global production network of gigafactories that make our grow boxes close to the local markets where they're going to be used. Now let me show you a couple of pictures of projects that we have done over the last 15 years. This is urban farming. There are 200 million people around the world doing that. They can create vegetables. Uh, as you see, very tasty organic product. We've got a user in California who managed to get more than 4,000 cherry tomatoes of one box in one summer. We're helping smallholder farmers around the world develop orchards and uh, grow vegetables to become self-sufficient. And we're working with the UN World Food Programme in Colombia and in six other countries to create sustainable food production systems so they don't have to import food, but the community can grow their own food. These couple of photos show how in space of just 11 months, we've got white teak growing to incredible height in an area that is very, very dry and only sees 111 uh, millimeters of rainfall a year. We're also planting grapes there, which again are doing fantastically. I said ecosystem restoration is another thing we can do. We can help green cities without using energy, without using expensive drip irrigation systems. We've planted in China, which is planting millions of trees every year, but they're all dying. Without technology, 90% survives. We're working in the Galapagos to help restore native, um, native trees and take out the other stuff. My call for action, to get quickly to that before you stop me, is that, voila, we are looking for an investor to invest 5 to 15 million euros to help scale up our organization and create that global production network of gigafactories. Your investment can address a true triple bottom line for maximum economic, social, and environmental impact. So I hope you can come see me after this session to discuss that in further detail. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. There's some, there's some, there's some great looking oranges there too. Um, and I hate to be known as the stalking moderator. Um, but uh, um, Joshua and, and Jan, um, again, another about a minute and 30 seconds. It'd be great to hear from you guys um, and uh, talking about your uh, joint partnership. Well, you just spoiled the deal. Oh, no. I'm <laughs> uh, well, I, yeah, you guys so, are working together. So. <laughs> indeed. So clearly, uh, a few minutes ago, we presented as separate ventures. And in the process of putting together the, the presentation for GES and in support with the Department of State and hosted by the, the government of Netherlands, we realized, uh, based off our own experience, we really want to focus on the delivery of this through a new organization. Uh, that is just being launched today. So uh, Regenerative Impact Ventures is, is what uh, will be the primary driver of delivering the Regenerative Utility Center and corresponding solutions. Jan's going to spend a moment just introducing what we're seeking and what we're offering. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Prita also for raising the importance of including uh, the uh, business prospects when helping uh, innovation grow to the next level. Uh, so essentially, uh, we're looking for both strategic partnerships and funding uh, for our idea. Uh, with that, we would hope to advance uh, regenerative utility, the regenerative utility platform 
and build out the related pl products that come with it. It's really a very new idea, and it requires, a, <laughs> particularly those who would normally invest into such systems, uh, urban municipalities and also the private sector to look at things a little bit differently. Uh, so the business case will be incredibly important. Uh, we would continue to implement pilots. We have already implemented uh, several uh, in various cities around the world. Uh, and then uh, we would scale uh, eventually across markets globally, uh, taking from the successes of our pilots and uh, discarding the failures and learning from them. So uh, what we are offering really then is an innovative solution uh, that enables the public and private sectors uh, both to uh, obtain development objectives much more effectively in an urban environment in many of the cases where you would otherwise be investing in conventional centralized uh, utilities and solutions to meeting uh, public service needs. Um, and the other aspect of this really is to create an opportunity, an attractive destination um, for impact-oriented investment from whatever source. Uh, and finally, then, to really play a role in taking this concept that we have and packaging it um, uh, and, and developing it uh, in so that it really can take the form of, of the assets that are attractive um, and comes to then change the way that public institutions invest and also, just as importantly, how the private sector uh, interacts with the, uh, the uh, public sector in coming up with overall investment plans for cities one, two, five, ten, twenty years into the future to be able to capture uh, the gains from a more efficient uh, use of, of resources and also averted costs, which is what we were talking about in uh, infrastructure. So uh, we welcome uh, ideas, feedback, and anybody who wishes to join us on this journey. Thank you so much. Great opportunity to be here and look forward to, to more conversations with you. Thank you. Terrific. Congratulations. You heard it here first, right? <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Uh, Louise, where is Louise? Hi, there she is. Hi. I wanted to bring a palm tree, but didn't fit inside my suitcase, <laughs> unfortunately. Hi, my name is Louise, and I speak on behalf of the Netherlands Embassy in India and my colleagues from all around the world. Um, we, as government representatives, share the idea that the focus should be on solutions centered around the nexus of water, energy, and health. Um, these solutions are much needed in a country like India, where groundwater will be scarce in 2030, and roughly 60% of the population is dependent on agriculture um, for primary livelihood. As governments, we can provide platforms like the GES to connect these solutions to decision makers and take them to the next levels from ideas to actual action. See the GES as the start of your journey together here with the other people of the value tracks. We invite you to the Technology Summit in India, New Delhi, in October later this year. Together with the Indian government, the Netherlands is looking for smart solutions uh, driven by technology focused around the, ne the, the, uh, the theme nexus centered around water, uh, agri-food and health. Um, at our technology summit, we will bring together more than 1,000 corporates, in investors, uh, knowledge institutions, and other people to make it actually work in India, but also worldwide. So we hope that you can join us in our journey from here in Amsterdam, creating these value tracks from here to Delhi, maybe to Dubai in 2020, and hopefully to the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Sorry, is this actually not something that you should be part of? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Talk so because I'm now thinking, and this is exactly what happens in that value track, because I'm getting all these messages from people, and I can see people connecting. And this is one of the things you mentioned to me yesterday, and I thought I could stay in the chair, or I can just... <laughs> Step on, come on out. Exactly. Cool chair. Um, so I'm a journalist, and <laughs> you should see, turn it around. What's on the back? What's it say on the back? Turn it all the way around. 
there's the solution stage <laughs> right there. Um, so anyway, so I'm a journalist, and I keep looking at this, and what's the big white space that's missing? We keep talking about making the connections between you know, investors and entrepreneurs and other projects. During our session this morning, we talked a lot about also value and values and how we bridge that. We also talked about messaging. How do we mobilize the public opinion? How do we mobilize uh, entrepreneurs of all ages, how do we get people actually excited about this grand challenge? It's not one narrative. It's not a narrative from a major PR agency, water is life. That doesn't work for everything. That's not going to drive dollars here quickly because this is, from my perspective, the most important breaking news story on the planet in addition to some of the things on the stage here. So what we did 10 years ago at the World Economic Forum, we launched something called Designing Water's Future because, as we said here, the only hope for water's future is the one that we deliberately design. And I'll add one word to that, fast. So this is fast design. This is like engineering, building the planes, you're going down the runway, right? Except everything is at stake that we care about. So what we're doing is 10 years ago, the World Economic Forum, we launched something called Designing Water's Future. It was a narrative design challenge globally. How do we talk about water? How do we bridge from values to value? Because if water doesn't have a value, if it doesn't have a story, we don't have investment and we don't have the entrepreneurship stage, so to speak. I mean, we need stages like this all around the world, right? So we're launching in today. We announced Designing Water's Future and with four major components. I'm going to invite you all to participate. Uh, we'll actually be launching this at World Water Week in Stockholm, um, but it's four pieces very quickly. A narrative, global narrative design challenge. So if you went to an ad agency, water is your client. That's the design challenge, right? So if water is your client, there are a million different narratives, whether you're in Jakarta or my home state of Michigan. The second part is my water story. We all have a water story, whether we're a, a a child in Jakarta, or whether we're a neighbor or a farmer in the Midwest of the US or Australia, where the Murray Darling Basin is under stress. And then that's my water science also. We talk about the data. How in the world do we capture the data? We have we have seven billion human sensors. Most of them have cell phones, right? So we need to listen a lot better. The third part, what do you do with all that data? How do we connect it? like what we're talking about here. You visualize it. You do a visualization challenge. We have amazing tools, many of which are used by our defense communities to do 3D modeling of, of situation rooms. Let's apply that to these grand challenges in the nexus. It's complicated. And number four, what do we end up with? We end up with a resilient bi-directional network. So enjoy, enjoy and invite you to join uh, Designing Water's Future, because that's, I think, what we're to do and today. last but not least, because this is one more where I was really happy, is that we have an announcement to be made as well. Because like we said, we're going to go global and we're going to make sure that this value track for uh, the Nexus is going to continue. Sorry, yes. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is André Driessen with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Director of International Enterprise. And what I hear this afternoon is really exciting. Uh, it's all about continuing innovations, continuing partnerships, and providing platforms and launching pads for all that the people around this room have thought about. We've talked about the Tech Summit in India, which is providing a wonderful opportunity for companies to move ahead. The Netherlands government is also participating in the Dubai Expo in 2020. Uh, from October 2020 to April 2021, under the uh, big theme of water, energy, food, the, the big theme of the Dubai Expo, connecting minds, creating the future, really relevant. The Dutch pavilion, an incredibly uh, fascinating pavilion, a circular pavilion, visualizing, uh, creating water, energy, food out of the desert. Uh, an exciting circular pavilion, as I said, providing a launching pad for you, a presentation platform, and let's move all these developments that we've had and heard about today, in the India Tech Summit, in the, all the other events that we'll be working on developing our, our ventures and our, our ideas and our innovations uh, to provide in Dubai for a global stage and for a global audience uh, a presentation platform. Our, plat our pavilion, our stage is available for you all to present your solutions on the water, energy, food nexus. Uh, and I hope to see you there. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. This means vibe, and I think we should keep the vibe. So everything that comes to mind, all these ideas that we just ran through, 
we need to make sure that, we're got, that you can announce them to us. And if we have enough power, then I'm sure that we can uh, uh, soon enough show you all the results. And based on your personal profile, you will get to see all the announcements made that are interesting to you. Let's build that knowledge and let's break, bridge that gap together. Fantastic, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, that's our call to action. More than a tweet. It's all, about, it's all about investment. It's all about entrepreneurship. And I think we are Done. a wrap. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.